All right, so here we go, We're trying to put some connections to things that you've learned, okay? We've had some homework, we've had some forms previously, I will put all of that together with this presentation. My focus here is to make sure that we keep connecting to the big ideas and not get lost in the details. The details are important, but again, it's the big ideas that we can always you know, grab a hold to and always remember as we go through the process of finishing the course. So we're talking about cell communication. We have talked and introduced the idea of these cell membranes and you know these important uh, cell membrane, the phospholipid layer. And the importance of this layer is that it's a semi-permeable membrane. And so it does not allow for many things to pass through, this being a non-polar hydrophobic region. So again, we have a polar head, but we have a hydrophobic region here that really does not allow for many things to go through. We have a lot of polar and big molecules that need to be regulated in how they enter. So we've talked about these transmembrane proteins, and I'm not loving this marker, um, talking about these transmembrane proteins, okay, that allow channels to go through. And although I've drawn them very simply, okay, a lot of these have to be opened or, or at least signaled by these glycoproteins, these receptors. So we know that things travel through. Aquaporins have a three-dimensional shape to allow water to go through. We know that large polar compounds can't get through this hydrophobic region. Okay, we have to make sure that we understand the big picture that a cell has an extracellular side and an intracellular side, the cytosol, the living is here. And this membrane keeps the non-living out and regulates important things. We know that the small non-polar, like O2, can go right through. We know the CO2 can diffuse out by the second law of thermodynamics from high, uh, dynamics from high concentration to low. Okay, but the real stars of the cell membrane really are these proteins. Now I'm drawing, of course, a, a transmembrane protein that's an aquaporin that allows water, which is polar, and because it's polar, there's a hard time getting through the cell membrane, especially this hydrophobic nonpolar region, right? So we have these three-dimensional protein, uh, proteins that allow water to go in and out. But what we're talking today is uh, about chemical signaling, whereas we're going to see that chemicals on the extracellular side of the cell can elicit a response inside by not traveling through. And that, of course, is done, again, by other proteins that can do something called reception of the ligand. Okay, and we've talked about this, we've experienced this. I'm looking for my black marker. Okay, well, let's try this one. Maybe this will be better. So um, here we go. Ah, oh, love and life here. Nice. Okay, so we've talked about this um, and we've had experience. In fact, we've had a lab and we use it two different ways. Remember the lab where we talked about the, um, the PDK, the, the uh, bitter tasting compound? Well, our tongue has these receptors and they're not a trans, they're a transmembrane protein, but those are like those G, uh, the G protein receptors we're gonna talk about today. But again, it's essentially a protein, and I'm just gonna oversimplify this, that has a receptor, and then when that bitter con uh, compound with a particular three-dimensional shape fits in this region here, it elicits a what? A three-dimensional conformational change that on the intracellular side can change this shape that will cause, okay, chemicals to now be activated. Now, there's many ways that can happen, but the most simplest way is that this ending now changed its shape once it hits what we call the ligand, that's the chemical messenger. In the case of the bitter tasting compound, that compound, okay, whether natural or not, it fits into a particular receptor that's unique for that chemical signal, causes a three-dimensional change where the ending, of course, changes so now that it can be active and catalyze some kind of uh, substrate. It could be some kind of kinase, which you'll hear about, that hits this new change and now becomes activated. It becomes phosphorylated. Remember in glycolysis, we added a phosphate? 
okay, that substrate le level phosphorylation that activates it. And of course, that starts a whole chemical pathway where that chemical can what? Uh, cause a response to another enzyme, and that's the chemical signaling that can eventually lead to the response. In the case of our tongue, okay, it didn't do quite all of this, but what the response was, it essentially opened up a channel for ions to go through so that it elicited a action potential to our brain to sit as a bitter compound. But we've been down this road. So we're talking about chemical signaling from the inside to the outside, not really about the passageway, although they're interrelated. And there's long distance, like the epinephrine that you did last or this weekend. Also, there's small, there's a short distance as we're gonna talk about. So let's get started, get crazy, and do some bio here. So we know cell-to-cell -cell communication is essential for both multicellular and unicellular organisms. So this leads us to understand that evolution had a very important selective pressure for us to keep messaging our other cells. Obviously, if you're multicellular, you need the cells to work together, okay? And so there has to be some kind of communication, all right? And we've discovered from the unicellular to the multicellular, there are some very universal mechanisms that have been around. That receptor, that G protein receptor that we use for epinephrine, of course, is also used in these small organisms, okay? And so we know that, they, that the simplest cells that we're gonna see communicate with, with chemical signals. And hey, we're talking about epinephrine in your report, the fight or flight response is triggered by a signaling mechanism that you guys learned, okay? So moving on, talk about that fight or flight response, us being a previous prey. I know that we dominate our landscape and kind of hurt our landscape because of that, too many humans on the earth, but we were once mostly prey, so we still evolutionally have this fight or flight response in us, okay? We'll talk more about that, all right? But in any case, the importance of it is that uh, through um, visual or emotions that we create, we create a scenario where we're able to raise up our metabolism, get it ready to run or fight for some intense activity. And that is done through long distance chemical signaling, as you guys talked about. Let's continue on. So there's external signals that are converted to responses in the cell. Of course, that's what the fight or flight is. However, not as advanced as what we do in fight or flight, microbes, bacteria, provide an important a glimpse of how this happens and of course how we evolved from. Okay, the yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, has two mating types, A and alpha. And of course, they utilize something called a signal transduction pathway, a very important big idea through all of this in my lecture today. is a series of steps where the signal on the cell surface, hey, makes a ligand, okay, is converted to a cellular response because of this transduction signaling. Okay, again, that's the big idea today. Signal transduction pathways, meaning some kind of chemical sig signal, that's the ligand on a receptor specific for it, okay, will create some kind of response by the cell, okay, by initiating some set steps or some cascading pathway of what? Of chemical reactions that may lead to opening up an operon that was closed or uh, producing any response that we're talking about. In the case of of your epinephrine, it was uh, dilating the blood vessels in your muscles, so the muscles can get more what? Um, uh, glucose, that's uh, being more metabolized by the epinephrine, that allows the liver to do what? Take the glycogen, the stored glucose, and release it as, fa as, as, um, as more glucose, so that what cell respiration can continue, all right? So they convert signals on a cell surface into cellular responses, and again, these responses are very, very specific. Okay, so an example of our yeast, two different types of yeast, notice they're both exchanging chemical signals, but that chemical signal is specific, is now a ligand on that receptor. Okay, and that could initiate a whole step of reactions that, get re that, that gets ready for this alpha uh, yeast cell to get ready to mate and accept and exchange DNA. Okay, same thing here, it releases a factor that's specific for that receptor to make a transduction pathway to set into play, well, I don't know, proteins and enzymes and reactions that get ready for that yeast to exchange DNA and mate, okay, as I run into something. So pathway similarity suggests that ancestral signaling molecules involved in prokaryotes, 
and of course modify for us eukaryotes bigger, more complex cells. But the basis for which we do chemical signaling is still very much the same. The concentration of signaling molecules allows for bacteria to sense local population density. So this is an important type as we're going to talk about biofilms. Hey, if you wake up in the morning and you feel that, that I don't know, that kind of the teeth feel gross. Well, that's a biofilm. Biofilms are example of aggregates of bacteria. Bacteria working together because there's food, okay? And of course, those bacteria, okay, living and, and working their way in your teeth can cause those cavities we talked about. But in any case, if there's a food source, they can work together. And how do they know, and why is there a film of bacteria in your teeth? Well, there's food there. And essentially, they give off chemical signals to each other to tell, hey, we're here. And usually, bacteria are here in large density because there's food there. So if you, again, they don't have a brain, but giving a chemical signal, okay, that's specific for a receptor, starts a whole chain of events, okay, to say, stay put, okay, or, uh, you know, uh, get ready to get some food and, and or, you know, um, uh, reproduce, create more bacteria. It's the, 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 the settings are right, the environmental conditions are right for us to stay here for a while. Of course, that's not what we want, that's why you brush your teeth. Okay, and also we learned about, in your form last week, about a fruiting body, when there isn't any food, but these cells and some types of cells, uh, bacteria, can work together by aggregating to a fruiting body. And a fruiting body is kind of like um, all these bacteria get together and um, they work together by some of the bacteria actually dying, become what? Food for other bacteria and as a population, the population gets to survive and low uh, food sources are available and they kind of uh, um, swarm as a collective group and work together with chemical signaling to, uh, to at least have some survive in low time. So it's interesting that bacteria, as simple as they are prokaryotes, they utilize this chemical signaling to work together. Obviously, it was a selective pressure to do so as um, you know, organisms that do work together do survive more. In any case, uh, this is not new to, uh, for the eukaryotes. So here's an example, as you can see in your book, all right? And moving on, and we know that there's long distance and there's local, okay? Obviously, the local um, distance signaling is when one cell can produce a chemical signal specific for a protein that's through this membrane, and of course, that signal is it's a response, and that could be a growth factor to tell this to, to, to the cell to grow because we're at the end of a root tip cell and we need to keep going. And any new cells are needed to reproduce quickly to make the end of the root grow out to find what nutrients and food for the growing plant. I see how important roots are for a plant. So if it's a brand new plant, they're in a race to get from the seed coat and the, and the zygote to producing photosynthesis. So the new okay, roots got to grow quickly to produce that. All right. Any case, animal plant cells have cell junctions that, that, can direct, that directly connect to each other to allow the cytoplasm to get through. Any case, local signaling animal cells may communicate by direct or cell to cell. Let's talk about that for a second. All right. So we know that there's gap junction between animal cells and that allows for things to diffuse. More importantly, those gaps are even bigger, more important in plant cells. Animal cells have a, um, a circulatory system that will, will deliver and have this diffusion. Plants do not. So they really, really have these gaps between their, uh, cy um, their cell membranes called plasmodesmata. Say that with me because we're gonna talk about that we talk about transpiration soon, probably tomorrow. So say plasmodesmata. Say it, plasmodesmata. It's a good feeling word, but it basically are just these gaps that allow. So if you have these cuboidal cells with the what? Cell membrane around, they don't have a, the, a circulatory system like animal cells, so they really need to have connections within the cells for things like their hormones, plants make hormones too, to go through. And, it's full, and of course water, okay? And of course the cell-to-cell -cell recognition is what we're gonna talk about in probably our next piece of the cell-to-cell -cell communication, that's the, uh, the immunity part, the white blood cells, recognizing if in fact we have an antigen, all right? So moving forward, we're talking about in many cases, animal cells communicate by using local regulators. These are messenger molecules that travel only short distances, okay? Now these local regulators, we now call a lot of times um, 
growth factors. There's many different types of growth factors. Again, uh, it's nothing more than a same, you know, a different example of the same idea where we have a chemical messenger, we call it a ligand attaching to a specific receptor that elicits this transduction pathway to cause a response. They're local because it's a cell that's what close to it sending that signal and that's an example of the biofilms sending uh, chemical signals to each other to aggregate hey there's food okay the long distance are the hormones a great example is your epinephrine okay we can consider that to be a, a long distance chemical signal because the epinephrine was a chemical given off by the adrenal gland on top of your kidney released in the bloodstream that goes to the, every part of the body and of course, the ability of a cell to respond to a signal depends upon whether or not it has the receptor. That is so important. Just because I'm sending out chemical signals, we have to have these specific receptors there so that we can have the pathway. All right. So if you don't have the receptors or if you've got a mutation in that receptor, you've got a disease. There are 60% or so of pharmaceuticals are built around trying to get that drug to fit in a certain receptor. They have manufactured drugs to try to turn on or turn off these receptors. Sometimes they block these receptors like a beta blocker, okay? If you wanna control the heart rate of an individual because they have a heart condition, you don't want to raise it up, you can have these chemicals bind with those specific receptor, receptors to block other things from uh, what? Turning them on so it, re it regulates the heart rate. So. Uh, pharmaceuticals are all about what they can build to fit into these certain receptors to turn them on and turn them off. And again, there's many diseases. If you've got a mutation, okay, in that receptor area, I know I'm drawing it very simply, it may not be able to accept that a correct chemical signal and you've got some issues and a disease there. Okay, so that's so important that we're talking about that specific regulation or that the signal is specific, okay, for that receptor and chemical that it's supposed to uh, attached to. So growth factor is a local signaling, okay, where we have target cells that are released and they have receptor specific. Another one we're going to get to when we talk about our nervous system is how nerves communicate to each other, at least how they pass on what we call an action potential electrical impulse signal from one to the other. And again, it's still chemical signal. It's local because the end of one nerve can, can send a signal to the the, the head of another nerve and let that signal keep going. And of course, the long distance, like your epinephrine, is where you have the endocrine cell, of course, in the um, top of your kidney, the adrenal gland, releasing the chemical into your bloodstream. And of course, the endocrine cell we're talking about here for epinephrine. And of course, that goes all over the body. And as we talk about today, or at least you talked about, we have these uh, GCP or these uh, G protein receptor uh, uh, conditions. I know it's, I'm drawing, it's not really the one. That one has actually seven places where it, 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 it cuts through the, mem through the um, tr um, cell membrane, but I'm just drawing something very simple here. But uh, we have these receptors that are unique for uh, epinephrine. Interesting enough, they create different responses based upon what the cell does. We'll talk about that. But in any case, it's important to understand those different types. Now, these growth factors um, can stimulate um, a cell to start dividing. Now we call them generally in biology growth factors, but they don't always uh, result in growth. They can do other things. It's just that when we started finding them, we found them first as the ones that stimulated uh, mitosis to occur, but not necessarily always gonna do that, but they keep calling them. Now we're gonna talk about uh, kinases, a lot of different chemicals that are important in this signaling pathway. When I talk about a signaling pathway that one chemical activates another chemical, activates another, um, let's say, enzyme that what does what? Makes substrates happen, and that's that pathway, kind of a metabolic pathway. Any case, very simple, we have a, a protein, whether it's a, uh, a, a G protein, protein kind of receptor or uh, a kinase, it doesn't really matter, but what we have is here, we have an accepting by a ligand, and that's that chemical that's, that has to be specifically, three-dimensionally, be able to be accepted by the shape of this maybe glycoprotein, and of course, conformationally changes the shape. This ending port now can do what? Catalyze, maybe now it can phosphorylate a kinase. Remember, substrate level phosphorylation? Okay, and then of course, a chain reaction 
Okay, that cascading of events where new reactions cause other substrates and catalysts, and eventually it leads to a cell response. Now, what it could lead is to a certain um, protein that does what? That could eventually, let's say, induce, okay, if you remember, we have in front of, oops, in front of operons upstream, what do we have? We have regulatory proteins that might be binding to an operon, okay, in the operator region of the promoter, right? The promoter region, you have an operator that's kind of on-off switch, but we have upstream, you have a regulatory protein that's binding and it's blocking RNA polymerase from transcribing it into messenger RNA that comes out and makes a protein. Well, hey, maybe this cascading effect where we have what? Reception, okay, transduction pathway, and then we have this cascading of chemical reactions that make other substrates that catalyze other reactions and eventually lead to an inducer that could bind to the what? The regulatory protein, change its shape so it can't bind and block RNA polymerase, and all of a sudden you turned on an operon. And all of a sudden now you're able to make something called CDK a cyclic dependent kinase, that's what we're gonna talk about in a second. And that is a factor, okay, if it's made, now of course, um, this, that protein or that, uh, uh, that chemical that now you have in great amount actually can turn on whether a cell is in the G1 phase, S1 phase, or starts mitosis, and we're we'll talking about that in a second. So, any case, let's look at that little pathway because we've talked about this all year, but when we continue on, so if you remember, in the growth cycle of a cell, or a life cycle, mitosis is a small little sliver of its life cycle. Most of the time it's in G1, it's growing, it's doing its job. And if you remember, we have some important checkpoints, okay? And probably the two most of this G1 and this um, kind of metaphase uh, checkpoint here. And if we don't have the right chemical signaling the cell stays in this GO cycle, which means it kind of just kind of stays in a G1. It's growing, it does its job. Now there's some cells that never go past this cycle, a nerve cell and a skeletal muscle don't. Okay, obviously nerve cells don't duplicate. There's probably some reasons why is they're so important in their job, they don't want to use up energy because in order to undergo mitosis, you've got to look at, to prepare for mitosis, you get past this checkpoint, you have the S phase. And we should remember here we're duplicating what? our chromosomes, our DNA here, okay? All right, and so, we're, so all of this is really in preparation. So if the life cycle is spending a lot of energy doing this, a nerve cell would have a tough time doing its job, okay? And again, uh, so that's important. What are those checkpoints? Chemical messengers. So let's continue on. Now, this is important if you understand that the cycle of the plant, this of course is G1, it was the S phase duplicating the chromosomes. Here we're getting ready for mitosis and the mitosis starts. Now. I've got three checkpoints here. Um, the most important one probably is the m cyclin checkpoint, but in any case, what do I have here? Well, let me explain, okay? What we have is cyclin dependent kinases, okay? And so what they are is the G1 or the M, okay? Now, we have this cyclin, okay, chemical. And this cyclin chemical, all right, will bind to, let's say, a G1 kinase. And when it binds to it, what it does, it creates, okay, a complex that's now activated. So you think about G1, it's a cyclin dependent kinase, don't worry about it, it's a molecule that's inactive. Now this cyclin, once it's made in the cell, hey, there's a chemical signal that the cell has a growth factor that the cell has a response by making more cyclin, so it rises up, it binds with the G1, and all of a sudden now, you have so much of it okay, that now we have, we passed this G1 checkpoint, okay? Now, it does degrade, okay? But the cyclin stays pretty hot. And now, all of a sudden, okay, it binds with something, another cyclin dependent protein. And no, no biggie here, okay? And, and it's something that makes it MPF, a maturation promoting factor. Sometimes they call it a metaphase. And that's the really one that we'll talk about here. And you don't have to know all of this, but as generally speaking, the cyclin binds with another cyclin dependent, okay, kinase, and that itself, okay, activates the checkpoint to get into mitosis, all right? And 
sometimes they call it the metaphase. And so obviously, to get through the metaphase into anaphase, um, there has to be a decrease. So these checkpoints that get us through, okay, are chemical signaling. And all, in, in order for this to work, if you think about this, the S-cyclin, okay, that's the protein that binds to a certain other molecule called a kinase, a cyclin-dependent kinase, makes it now, when these guys bind, it bind, it activates them, and activates them in a way that we can now do what? Have a checkpoint. So when we have, you know, enough of these and these guys binding, that starts a chain of reactions that lets the G1 get through the S phase. Remember, the G1 is preparing, is growth, and all of a sudden now, we're getting ready to duplicate what? The DNA. What do we do when we duplicate DNA? Don't we need helicase to unzip, topoisomerase to, un to cut the, sh the stretching out points when you turn them? All the, the, all the proteins that, the single-stranded binding proteins that stick so that they don't come back together. All that stuff we learned about, okay, when is that signal? You have to have a lot of them. Helicase has to be around. So it's these, okay, a member, uh, cyclin molecule binding with, I'm oh, sorry, the cyclin molecule that stays here binds with this factor. And now, of course, it is this molecule made by the cell because of a chemical messenger that makes this, uh, this compound become activated. And that they're, when they're together, they take the cell from the G1 to the S because when they're together, they act as a basically new enzyme that does a whole what? System of what? Of uh, chemical reactions that leads to helicase being produced, to single-stranded proteins being produced, okay, topoisomerase being produced, DNA polymerase being activated, all the things that we talked about for uh, replication of DNA that happens in the S phase, you have to have the proteins in high amount. So that activates them. Now, of course, there's a degradation here, but the, this cyclin stays high until it hits the new um, CDK, and that one takes them past Okay, the checkpoint to start mitosis. Okay, so what does this do? It activates the proteins or the uh, catalyzes so many different things in the cell to get them ready to what? Wind up the, uh, the DNA into chromosomes and to uh, cut away the cohesive proteins that sister chromatins have, the, create the spindles. All of that needs to be catalyzed and the activated form of this type of cyclin dependent kinase binding with this M cyclin, when they come together, they create, of course, all right, a activated complex or an activated enzyme that catalyzes a whole bunch of other reactions. Interesting enough, when you get to anaphase, okay, a couple of complexes that are made in anaphase, they degrade, okay, the cyclin. And we start again. So it's interesting the cyclin with the um, other cyclin dependent protein creates an activated complex that does what? That sets, a, sets up a whole series of reactions that makes the proteins and, 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 and all these things happen in mitosis as we talked about, but also creates through its cascading effect downstream into some structures that wind up by what we can call somewhat negative feedback, stopping or degrading the uh, cyclin from this cyclin and degrading the S cyclin down. And of course, it, it, it comes off of the CDK protein and here we start the process again. So this is a timing factor, but it's nothing more that's signaled by chemicals, okay? Uh, and of course, an easy way to think about it, we have the CDK again. We're talking about one important checkpoint, let's say the checkpoint into mitosis. There's, there's, there's others, but the CDK is, uh, you know, is going to increase because there's a chemical signal. It hooks up with an MPF at the highest amount. When it has a highest amount, this is going to catalyze a whole bunch of, 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 of proteins and, and other um, chemicals that are helpful into doing what? Getting us and starting through mitosis. And then, of course, it creates at the same time other chemicals that degrade it at the end, and we start the process again. But again, it's all about chemical signaling. Any chemical signaling that increases your CDK will get you past the checkpoint. Think about cancer, okay? Cancer where you have uncontrollable growth, which means your checkpoint could be constantly what? 
constantly on, the cell shouldn't be on, okay? Or it could be sooner, depending upon what other problem in the DNA is causing so much CDK to be produced, all right? Things that hopefully are connecting for you, all right? Their onion root tips have to be in a constant state of mitosis. This root has to grow out, so these cells have to duplicate. So the cells that are undergoing a lot of what? Mitosis here, okay, have to send chem growth factors that do what? Increase the CDK so it hits up with the uh, cyclic dependent kinase and make an activated what chemical that, again, catalyzes a whole bunch of reactions that create mitosis. So they, these guys have to keep uh, sending out signals to keep doing that to keep this root tip growing out, okay, especially when the, the, um, the growing plant is young. All right, so another way to think about this or in plants and animals, phototropism. Now, there isn't as many hormones. Well, I mean, again, we say hormones in plants are not long distance like animals. They don't have a circulatory system, but there are um, a, a few pro, um, hormones, and one is auxin, okay? And auxin is a hormone, kind of like a growth factor that stimulates growth. And in order, it's kind of interesting. We all know that plants bend. We've talked about phototropism. We talked about maybe the height of plants. Remember our, one of our first labs wanted to compare the height in fluorescent, the height of our fast plants in fluorescent versus the height of the plants in LEDs. And one of the things there, if you're not getting enough light, plants will grow up, okay, or lean. And that's phototropism. And so it's interesting enough, the side that's getting more light, this leaning effect, well, gosh darn it, if they're getting more light, they're able to make more G3Ps, right? The product of photosynthesis is that these palisade layers of cells, these are the cells of the chloroplast, they can make, it as with more light, more of the organic components, and therefore they can actually make more of the hormones. And one of the hormones they make is auxin. Now, if the side getting more light makes more auxin, it's going to diffuse by the gaps called plasmodesmata. Say it with me, plasmodesmata. And it can what? It can move by diffusion. It's passive transport from high to low, second law of thermodynamics. We're going to disperse the energy. And these cells will have a high amount of what? A high amount of growth. So these cells grow greater than these cells. And guess what? You get that movement that way. And that's how phototropism, and it's a tremendous uh, evolutionary advantage because they're going to grow toward the sun and as the plants grow toward the sun they are more of course going to have greater fitness as they're able to photosynthesize more because they get more light okay so we're connecting things that we've had from the beginning of the year through the labs okay moving on and here's an example light hits this side produces more more the um, phototropin and we've got this diffusion okay and of course more growth all right all right, moving forward. And then we have transpiration we'll talk tomorrow about. Okay, local signaling, we're in long distance. We've been down this road. Okay, this is really important. Three stages of cell signaling. We have the reception, that's the ligand, that's the chemical mess signal, okay? Into um, the receptor, which is on the extracellular side of the cell membrane. Then we have transduction, that's that signaling pathway through Okay, the membrane, okay? Most signals don't go through. They've done some important studies where they realize if you take epinephrine, okay, we don't get the same responses by putting epinephrine with these molecules. Meaning if you take epinephrine, forget about the, uh, the uh, GTP pathway that we learned and put it with the chemicals inside a cell, we don't get the same response. We need this transduction pathway to catalyze that, okay? And of course, the response is what the cell does because of the chemical signaling that travels. Can't say enough how this is everything, okay, in chemical signaling. Can't say enough. And you're going to see this big idea repeat itself over and over and over. So then we have the reception. We have the relay molecules and signal transduction. Now, the relay molecule epinephrine was cyclic AMP, wasn't it? Okay. Even though this is really, really yeah, very simple description, we have the reception of the epinephrine, and of course, okay, we eventually catalyze reactions that make cyclic AMP, and that's the secondary messenger that causes that cascading effect, what would you call the transduction signal? And of course, that leads 
to eventually the cell response. And that could be opening up and starting an operon. It could just be signaling the, the, the chemical, to, signaling the cell to make certain other chemicals by what? Phosphorylating certain enzymes and activating them. Substrate level phosphorylation we've talked about. Okay, so here's the reception. The binding between a signal molecule, the ligand, and a receptor is highly specific. I made this very, very si simple, and they'll do this to you. You know, different receptors, okay, will have different, what, shapes, and they draw them very simple, but don't forget, these are three-dimensional proteins that have R groups that are specific shapes. You've got a mutation there. You change that shape possibly if it's a what? Missense mutation where you change an amino acid that changes the shape. It may change its function. Hormone function is still here. The shape change in a receptor is also the initial transduction of the signal. There's a what? An allosteric change. Remember, that's the same as, hey, we did the phosphorofructokinase, which was the third step of glycolysis. That enzyme, okay, was a regulatory protein. That was, the, that was basically the switch to stop or start glycolysis, anything that follows through. And follows through. If the uh, phosphorofructokinase is on, glycolysis happens. If it's off, it stops. And so how do we do non-competitive inhibition? Something binds to the phosphorofructokinase, changes its shape so the active site is off. These are things that are similar. Come on, party people, stay with me. Okay, most water-soluble signal molecules bind to the specific sites of the receptor. These guys can't get through the membrane, right? There are three main types of membrane receptors, G protein-coupled receptors, GPCPR, GPCR, I should say. Okay, and this is what we study. I made you do a little bit of writing about this one. Some people looked at the Khan Academy there. There's the tyrosine kinases and the ion, ion channel, okay? 60%, again, of most pharmaceuticals are here. There are, there are, I don't know, there's so many of these. And remember these, you may have a, 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 a guanine protein coupled receptor. Okay, by the way, GTP, does that sound familiar? Remember in the, um, Prep cycle, we made GTP as one of the uh, um, one of the energy kind of compounds. There we use it right here. Okay. Any case, that being said, um, these two right here are very very common. And although I'm naming only two, each one is specific. They're receptor in this type of uh, channel or transduction pathway through a transmember protein. Okay, specific based upon a certain chemical messenger. Don't think that because there might be hundreds and hundreds of G proteins, that they all do the same thing. These ion channel receptors are something we'll get into when we get into the nervous system and how an action potential travels through a neuron, which is uh, something we'll talk about. So we have the G protein coupled receptors, the largest family. It's a plasma receptor, it's an on-off switch. Epinephrine is a hormone made by the adrenal gland. It's located on top of the kidney. And of course, that uses that type of receptor. And you have to understand that causes so many different things in our body, which means most of our, a lot of our body, with different types of cells have those receptors. But it must be important you understand that even though I might have the same receptor, and I know this is not the right diagram for that, they elicit different responses, right? The skeletal muscle does something different than the arterial smooth muscle. So in a skeletal muscle, we have vasodilation. We open up the passageway so all blood gets to the skeletal muscle, right? Epinephrine's part of fight or flight, gives us more blood flow for our muscles to get ready to run or fight, okay? Well, in the heart or in the circulatory system, the arteries, it's a vasoconstrictor to increase the blood pressure. We want to collapse on it so we got more force through the blood so the blood can travel faster to certain areas. If you make the space smaller, they'll get there faster, okay? In the lungs, you have smooth muscle around your passageways that get to your lungs to exchange gases. That smooth muscle relaxes so that the, the, the airwaves get bigger so you're ready to what? Take bigger, deeper breaths. And why would you do that in epinephrine response, fight or flight? You're getting more oxygen. More oxygen because you need that for more cellular respiration to produce energy to fight or flight. It's all interconnected. So how do all these different responses uh, all have the same type of receptor but leads to different what? Different responses. Well, okay, they might all have the same response or secondary messenger, but there might be different chemicals downstream that lead to a different cellular response. It's important you understand that, okay? So in any case, going further, so I'm gonna scare Henry.
<laughs> Notice the hands going up. Here comes Andy. Now here's the hands going up to fight. Now those hands going up is actually reflex to protect our hands, our head, because of our eyes. So your hands come up and do those things. All right? So that's just a reflex to protect our heads. That's not necessarily a fight or flight, but I guess seconds after that, their blood pressure is raised. Okay, it does happen pretty fast, but they're probably, their heart is racing. You could do this just by thinking about something you might do in front of people, like a big performance. Okay, we can cause epinephrine to be released. Um, and another way to think about epinephrine too is, um, you know, people that have um, uh, allergies where they take in a foreign substance that the body thinks is a is uh, you know a um, uh, a harmful organism and they attack it and part of the body's response to an invading organism okay is um, having an inflammatory uh, inflammatory response where we we bring fluid into certain areas and that could cause passageways especially your your throat to cause the smooth muscle around your uh, bronchioles to get tight and contract and make smaller, smaller passageways or just bring in fluid in that area. And what we can do is epinephrine, some people carry an EpiPen, whether it's a bee sting or for other things, they carry an EpiPen and by shooting themselves with, uh, or someone would do that if they had an allergic response, well, what happened is by shooting an epinephrine, that signal causes a transduction pathway for the cells or the, blood, the smooth muscle in your bronchial areas to relax and get bigger so that you don't have a, an event where you can have a really, really tough medical issue there. Okay, so moving on. Epinephrine is one of many hormones that is water soluble, hydrophilic, and therefore unable to cross the hydrophobic plasma membranes of its target cells. Instead, it binds to receptor proteins located in the plasma membrane and does not enter the cell. When epinephrine binds to beta-adrenergic receptors on the liver cell, G proteins on the inner side of the cell membrane Peripheral are activated. proteins, right? Each G protein is composed of three subunits, and the binding of epinephrine to its receptor protein Alpha, causes beta, one of the G, the G protein, protein subunits to dissociate from the other two. The G protein subunit, which dissociates from the others, carries a GDP, which is replaced by GTP when the subunit is activated. The activated G protein subunit then diffuses within the plasma membrane until it encounters adenylyl cyclase, a membrane enzyme that is inactive until it interacts with the G protein subunit. When activated by the G protein subunit, adenylyl cyclase catalyzes the formation of CAMP from ATP. The CAMP formed at the inner surface of the membrane messenger. diffuses within the cytoplasm, where it binds to and activates protein kinase A, an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to specific cellular proteins. Substrate level phosphorylation. In liver cells, protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates another enzyme called phosphorylase, and here is that which converts chemical glycogen signaling into pathway. glucose 6 phosphate. The glucose 6 phosphate is then converted to glucose. Through this multi-step mechanism, epinephrine causes the liver to secrete the glucose, glucose into the blood easy, during okay? the fight or flight no, no, no. reaction. That's not correct. Okay, we have to leave by vesicles, right? Glucose is polar. Okay, but this, this video shows you how this receptor, which physically is the same as all receptors for epinephrine, gives a specific response. The liver cell releases what? Gl uh, glucose, right? So the signaling pathway the response at the end of this chemical signaling transduction pathway is for it to release what? Glucose. Glycogen is just glucose bonded to glucose. It's the starch of animal cells. So we store, okay, glucose a little bit in our liver and we produce it in high amounts through the fight or flight response once epinephrine, of course, is released into our bloodstream as a long distance messenger, okay? And that response of this cell will be different than that of the smooth muscle cell of the bronchial tubes in your lungs 
or the skeletal muscle, okay? It's really important to understand that the reception is the same, but this different, there's a different pathway that leads to a different result, okay? Okay, so we have, there it is, the G proteins, there's that seven transmembrane brown, okay, complex, we've been through it, we talked about how it worked, okay? We also have receptor tyrosine kinases, RTKs, it's another example of a membrane brown way to deliver a signal through the what? Membrane, okay, that elicits a conformational change. Chemical signal, the chemicals are not traveling through a passageway, they're eliciting a response through a protein. Okay, it's not important to know how they all work, but just be re realize that, that there's different ways to do it. Okay, and I'm not gonna get into specifics of it, but guess what? There's a ligand, so there's reception. There's a transduction pathway that that signaling creates, okay, a relay, okay, a, a signal to get through the shape to do what? Activate, okay, a cellular response through activating proteins and making those proteins that are already there in the cytoplasm ready to be activated to start the chemical signaling for whatever response it occurs. We'll talk about a ligand gated ion channel when we get to nerve cells in the nervous system, okay? All right, now, intracellular receptor proteins are found in the cytosol. Let's say smaller hydrophobic chemical messengers can really readily cross, okay? So things that are small, as we talked about, are hydrophobic can uh, cross, but examples of hydrophobic messengers that are, are steroids and thyroid hormones of animals, meaning there are nonpolar things that don't need to have a protein, have a reception. Something that is nonpolar, like steroids, which we should know are made in cells that do not have a rough ER, that is smooth ER. Oh my gosh, connections, all right? But these steroids are nonpolar, therefore they're able to move through the nonpolar region. So they don't have reception like. Um, a uh, epinephrine does. However, there is still reception. There is a what? Inactive protein somewhere or inactive chemical that can what? Can be activated when it hits the steroid. So even though there's not reception in terms of a um, ligand, there is reception because there has to be a chemical in this certain cell that can what? receive that and now become activated to sort of start a whole new pathway and create a response. So even though testosterone is an example that can go into every cell, okay, not all cells have the what? Have that chemical that, that can receive it and be activated. Just a different way to do that. Just want to make sure you understand. It doesn't always have to be through that. So here we go with this path where I'm almost done today. Thank you for being so patient. So the hormone goes directly through the membrane because the membrane is mostly nonpolar, like dissolves light, and you have a what? You have a, you have a hormone receptor complex that becomes activated that can cause a whole chemical signaling to occur, which one of the ways could be is to what? To activate your DNA, turn on an operon, produce a protein that normally wasn't being made, and give that response. So that's really important. Messenger RNA gets out, make a new protein. All right, and of course, transduction signal, and this is really important, cascades of molecular interactions relay signals, okay? It's like falling dominoes, and as I tried to show you, it's a relay of um, chemical reactions that start other chemical reactions, that, that cascade into other chemical reactions, and the, um, the star to show these protein kinases that transfer phosphate, substrate level phosphorate, phosphorylation that activates, okay, these inactive compounds. And it, it is a real cascading of a domino effect, okay? Because it turns on so many and it amplifies the signal, okay? So it's a huge, huge molecular switch putting these phosphates on that um, these kinases provide. And here's just a simple way to do it. Signaling reception, transduction signal, allosteric chains, activate some kind of protein and then you have these active protein kinases that can do what? Turn on others, and those others can find others, and the beat goes on. You can think of it as one thing, okay, affecting two, and those two can affect two more, and you've got that growth if you've been studying that math, and it just goes on, and the numbers of, of chemicals can grow that are activated, and that allows for very quick, quick signal to reach whatever other chemicals it has to reach, okay? And of course, 
the other star, these secondary messengers that, are, that, that do that. And they could be the kinases. In the case of epinephrine, it was the what? The cyclic AMP, all right? In any case, calcium ions are another example. And I'm going to stop here. I think we've done enough. Uh, oh, no, we haven't done enough. Cyclic AMP is one of the most widely used chemical messengers. Just because we have that chemical messenger doesn't mean it's only for the epinephrine pathway. We should know that adenylene cyclase ACE, a protein, is the enzyme in the plasma membrane that the GTP, okay, actually activates to do what? To create it, all right? And again, that's just the one particular pathway. And just so you know, the adenylene cyclase does what? It takes this compound, okay, and essentially it takes a phosphate and it makes cyclic AMP. And you should know this compound is what? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and it cleaves two phosphates to make that cyclic AMP. Interesting enough, cyclic AMP is that secondary messenger that activates. We have to stop the epinephrine. If you didn't talk about this in your, um, in your mini report, you probably should have, because if we're in a constant state of fight or flight, we're probably gonna die. We're gonna be using up energy sources. We can't have our metabolism revved up all the time, just like an engine that's on 8,000 RPMs, what, what does that happen if you redline it too much? You blow out the engine. So we have something called phosphodiesterase, another ACE, another what? Enzyme. You know what it does? It breaks down the cyclic AMP back to AMP, and that decreases the cyclic AMP that eventually causes the chemical signaling to lead to the response of the fight or flight. So this is what turns off the epinephrine signal. Interesting enough, people think caffeine. Boy, you drink caffeine and you're up all the time, you're stimulating. You know what caffeine does? It blocks phosphodiesterase from doing that. So what, by blocking phosphodiesterase and you being thinking about things, you build up cyclic AMP and there's no way to what? Turn that switch off and you have that heightened response. And being on too much coffee is not good for your nervous system. So they have very similar shapes there, kind of a cool little thing. I hope you put some of that in there, okay? All right, and so phosphodiesterase, again, limits and reverts the cyclic AMP back into AMP so that you don't have that chemical messenger leading to a cascading of cell responses for your uh, epinephrine. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Hope you enjoyed that and put some things together.